Hello and welcome to the Geometer's Compass. We are really excited to be on episode four now and we are taking an extra special turn today because for the first time ever, we have our special guest. This is a, a new departure for Scott and I. So this is Jeff speaking from Dublin in Ireland uh, and I am alongside... Scott Onstott in Victoria, Canada and we are joined today by George sure. Leoniak in... In Marlborough, Vermont. Great. In Vermont. Sorry, I didn't catch that, George. Whereabouts in Vermont? Marlborough. That's the southeast corner. Ah, okay. Well, you are very, very welcome. So just for our listeners, just to give everybody a context of where we met, Scott and I did our inaugural, our very first workshop on the squared circle. And one of our favorite things, in fact, the favorite thing about doing these workshops is it gives us an opportunity to meet like-minded people. You know, even though we love the detail of sacred geometry, we love all of the majesty of the patterns that are revealed by this discipline. To be honest, uh, in our hearts, Scott and I are most excited about the people we get to meet. Because when you light a fire and you kind of set off this beacon that kind of calls people that share the passion for sacred geometry, like-minded people show up. And chief amongst those was, was a, a real luminary, uh, George, who joined our course, and he was a really passionate contributor on the forums and, and in the sharing modules. George is so far deep down the rabbit hole of sacred geometry that both Scott and I were in awe of his discoveries. And we just absolutely loved his shares. And it just felt really, really right to kind of like reconnect and say, hey, George, how you doing? Would you like to come and join us on our podcast so we could just explore the majesty of sacred geometry together? So we don't really have any hard or fixed agenda for this talk. We want to keep our podcast in this casual conversational flow. And in the spirit of that, George, how are you doing today? Oh, yeah, I'm fantastic. It's really an honor to be here. Thrilled to see you guys again and get to connect in this venue. Yeah, I mean, just describing, I mean, I think when Scott, when I first saw the Sacred Geometry Academy post out, you know, that they were going to kind of, you were trying to reconstruct like a Plato's Academy. I was like, Ding. I was like the first person signed up, I think, into that course. I mean, I was so excited to connect with you guys. I remember you made the very first post in the community. You know, you were like, yeah, you were like breaking breaking the ice there. So I appreciate that, you know? I know, before anybody was really even on the forum, I posted a couple of things and then it slowly, people started to join in as time went on, but I was- yeah, I was really amazed at how it really took off a life of its own and people really were posting very rapidly while we were having our workshop there, you know? Oh yeah, it was fantastic. Yeah, it's great. I really am thrilled with what you guys put together there. I think it's a real service to the whole sacred geometry community for sure. And I'm thankful to have a opportunity to share the findings I'm coming up with there all the time. You've been discovering some amazing things lately, George, and I wanted to give you a chance to kind of take us through a little bit about that at kind of a 30,000 foot level about what it's all about, whatever you've discovered. And um, you've been posting on, on the, in the community there. And I just want to give you a chance to kind of discuss what you've been really passionate about lately. Yeah, totally. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, well, I have a, uh, first of all, I got a lot of YouTube videos up, you know, primarily I've been posting YouTube videos at a site called New Geometry, K-N-E-W, you know, not N-E-W, but New Geometry. And, um, you know, it's hard to break out any sequence of discoveries, like one thing by itself, because they all just kind of snowball together. You know, it's like once you pull on the, the yarn, it starts, the whole ball comes with it or something like that. They're all linked. Um, but I guess the latest thing that I've kind of been working on that I've really been excited about is working with the flower of life and incorporating these uh, phi base circles. So, you know, the seed of life, you know, the six around one. Mm -hmm. But what I've been doing with that is kind of taking a, uh, a, a, a the large circle and then putting inside it a proportional circle that's based on phi within that and then building out the flower of life around that. And it adds this whole way to kind of draw the platonic solids, the icosahedron and dodecahedron, really uh, beautifully within that, you know. Um, so that's one of the things I've been excited about. And once you start working with phi, it just snowballs into, you know, working with Penrose tiles now is all of a sudden the latest thing. So I've got into Penrose tiles and tiling surfaces with the Penrose tiles. I mean, you know, I'm starting to work. I'm working on this right now. It's just 
made the little cutout template and starting to piece together the tiles. Mm -hmm. It's so different than working with that hexagonal uh, matrix, which just goes on and on like forever in that periodic way. But this, this pattern does that too, but it does never mm -hmm. repeat. And that's just so fascinating to me that you have a, a, a pattern that will go on infinitely, but then never repeat the way you would with, you know, the basic flower of life pattern, the hexagon structure. I see that more as like, it, it's working with five and five, it has this quality of, of being alive or, or something and, and, and unexpected novelties occur in life. Whereas the hexagonal grid is more about structure. It's about the in, inorganic structure of crystals and of the way you stack anything that's cylindrical. It's always a, in, a, in a hexagonal pattern and snowflakes are that way and so on. So it, it has that kind of lifeless crystalline quality. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. And it's nice to get into the five because then it's more like, oh my God, it's, where's it going? And what is it doing? And it's fascinating. It's much more interesting, don't you think? Oh, totally. I mean, that's why I think I'm gravitating to, you know, the, the hexagonal flower of life pattern without these five base circles I discovered, you know, through the mathematics that you can't actually draw the dodecahedron and icosahedron in there accurately, you know? So when I put these five base circles in, all of a sudden I can incorporate those other forms with the accurate dimensions. And that was real revelatory for me because I just, before I always thought that they were in there and that was all, all good. But when I discovered that you needed to add this little extra flavor to it, let's just say, with these other five base circles, that just really broadened my perspective and horizon, you know? And another thing I like to do with the geometry is I love to show it from different angles, you know? Show it from multiple perspectives. So, you know, the hexagon view is the cube from a vertex view. So you're looking straight down at it from above. But I like to show the cube, draw it from the side, draw it from a side view with the vertex up, you know, the square view, show all the angles. So we see just a broader view than just well, this is one view of sacred geometry over here that most people are familiar with, but sacred mm -hmm. geometry includes all these other views. Yeah, and I've been impressed with the physical paper models that you've made of, mm -hmm. of your hedra discoveries and how you're bringing sacred geometry out of the paper, out of the flatland, and you're, yeah. see, you're seeing how it works in three dimensions. You know, that, that reminds me a little bit of Buckminster Fuller and, and the kind of fascination he had with Hedra forms and the, you know, and it, it seems like you, you've taken up his, his area and you're, you're going forward into new areas with that. You, you even came up with your own polyhedron. Isn't that right? I love, um, I love what you're saying, Scott. And I'm just, um, just going to interject briefly here for our um, dear listeners, you know, just to give some specific examples of what George brought to the course, you know, that, uh, essentially, we were drawing a lot and on on the the flat plane, as you mentioned, Scott. But then George has this exquisite skill of bringing these forms into into three dimensions, you know, and and you've you've been able to show us these beautiful artworks that you've made, um, which is like you know baffles belief to be honest. So the you had the Gaia hedron and you had the yeah. some other hedron and. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to I'd love to hear more about those. Do you, know? you have one of those models? Oh, there yeah, it is. I, yeah. I got all surrounded by all these. So this is the this is one of the first forms I started posted on there was the, the geohedron form. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it, it was um first the of all, I got how I got there it was very much through uh through Scott and his program, the uh what do you call it, Scott? The the Euclidia the, sketches that we use in the constructions course. The constructions course, yeah. So um, you know, I got an iPad right before class and before I was doing everything by hand and cutting out paper models and doing that. But once I got that accuracy, the ability to work with the accuracy of that program, it opened up a whole new frontier for me. And you guys saw all that kind of flourishing class because yeah, I was able to yeah. draw parallel lines. I was able to take that 3D to 2D and create the forms and the templates. I mean, I do all that on that Euclidia sketches program, but I was doing so much of the grunt work before just by hand and being like, is that really, uh, you know, 108 degree angle or am I off there? You know, you can't tell, but mm -hmm. you're like, I think it is. But then with the program, all of a sudden I was like, yes, I can actually create now accurately. So that gave me the ability to kind of 
make this model, which I was really thrilled about because I included all the platonic solids in this. And it's based off of uh, the earth grid based on Becker Hagen's earth grid. And mm -hmm. what I wanted to do was incorporate all the platonic solids in the cubic dihedron and bring them all to the surface of the earth. So all the vertices would be in the sphere touching the outer surface of this. So it was like everything kind of came into balance along the surface of the sphere. And I was able to kind of draw that and construct it in that program and then discover, well, it lays over the, the current earth grid. So I went into Google earth and then I traced out, you know, the earth on this form by just following Google earth and finding where all these vertices kind of gave me the way to just draw the pattern of the earth on here. It was like, did you decide to hook like the map on a certain point? Like, did you use like absolute North or something for a, to match the North pole or how did you decide? Uh, yeah, that was neat. Uh, I, if I showed you that in 2d, cause I can open it up point 40 here, which so right over here, point one, I don't know if you guys can see this. That's where the pyramid is uh, in Giza. So uh -huh. that's point one on the map. That's a very but, wise choice as your kind of origin point. I think. <laughs> yeah. Well, it actually turned out to be um, point 40, which was very close to that. Uh, just in still in Africa, point 40 is like down here. And that mm. became the place where I could open up the map and have two hemispheres of the map flat on a surface so i could start from there and fold it all up from that point um so that's that's why point 40 became important it reminds me of fuller's dimaxian map which was a polyhedral map of the earth unfolded mm -hmm. and i remember really studying that and thinking gosh this is a great way of looking at the earth because it it gets away from our preconceptions of of what the continents look like and it shows new relationships between the land masses that you hadn't thought of maybe before and have you have you thought about that have you looked at your two-dimensional map and made some new connections in your mind about how things relate on the earth has mm -hmm. that led you to any new insights well i mean i i did check out his uh dimaxium map and all the research that was going on and i i talk about that all in the videos which are underneath the earth grid um, I think that's what the sequence of videos are called. So I do describe my process of kind of going around it. And one thing about the, um, you know, cause part of it was based on the rhombic tricontahedron. So it's, and what I discovered with the, the faces are, the vertices are sunken in, they don't actually come to the surface of the earth. So that was what I wanted to do is inflate all those vertices and bring them up to the surface of the earth. So in terms of the question of, um, you know, did it change my perspective? Totally, I mean, uh, First of all, the, the Pentagon, the five-pointed star became a really like prominent feature. You could see, can you see the five-pointed star right here? Yes. Yes, I can. Yes. Yeah. So that, that became the, the prominent feature. And it got me really thinking about, you know, the North and South Pole, because when we look at that, a five-pointed star like that is at the North Pole, and it's also at the South Pole. And that's basically an icosahedron is in this shape. And that's what's creating that upper and bottom vertices was the icosahedron. And it just got me really thinking about uh, bar magnets and the flow of energy, you know, like in torus-like structures, because the earth is like a, you know, giant torus-like structure. And I always like to make relations. Well, how does this connect to my body? You know, a lot of sacred geometry, people connect the forms to their body, to the energetic field, the unseen field. And what is the earth telling us about our relationship to those, you know, unseen geometries that are around us. What is the earth telling us if these like Buckminster Fuller and the Russian scientists, they chose the icosahedron as the, the top vertice and the bottom vertice of this structure. So it makes me ask questions about, about those sort of questions. How do we relate this to a kind of uh, hollow micro macrocosmic microcosmic connection, you know, on multiple levels. And, you know, the George. tetrahedron, if you put that inside the earth, that one of the points is on the Mauna Loa volcano in Hawaii, which is the largest mountain in the world, if measured from the sea floor. Oh, wow. Um, and so there's there's something about the hedra geometry that does resonate with planets. And of course, Saturn's North Pole has this persistent hexagon that appears in the in the gases. Even though the gases are continuously swirling around, there's this hexagon which has lasted for decades. We've seen it with the Voyager and with the Cassini, 
you know, many years later, it's still there. And so there, there's something about how polyhedron do interface with planets. And, mm-hmm. and we have a little bit of evidence of that, you know. And so yeah. I think it's really fascinating that you're, you're throwing that grid around the world. And yours is even more expansive than the other ones that have come before, because it's showing all the different platonic solids simultaneously with their vertices on the surface. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah, it's got 240 faces. Um, So, and and it had 122 vertices, I believe. I'm going back in time now. I'd have to revisit the video. I'm pretty sure it's 122 vertices, 240 faces. And then it's, um, I I was doing a lot with the great circles um, that Buckminster Fuller works with, where you, you connect vertices and kind of create these hoops around the earth. And his model at the time, I believe, came up with 31 great circles. And I discovered I could put like 90 around this, you know? Now, that doesn't say, oh, it's bigger, it's better, or anything like that. It just expands our, our level of connection to that model and just takes it a little bit further in my mind, you know, to just see that we can go a little deeper into looking at that. You know, my dream was, uh, you know, to, to get this into like a little kit or something like that. And I could picture kids or adults, you know, piecing that together and then looking at the earth through that lens of the geometries that are associated with it. You know, I was, I was saying, it's kind of like, if you have one of these in the classroom, it's like a, a ge- it's like a, a geometry Trojan horse or something for kids, you know, because it brings nice. all those other platonic solids into the classroom. Cause then you say, Hey, look, it contains these platonic solids. All of them are touching the vertices. And then you pull in and you reach out well, here's the tetrahedron. Here's the icosahedron. This is the, the decahedron and the cube octahedron is in there too. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden you've got the earth, you've got the platonic solids and it brings kids or adults like right into the geometry, you know? And it's then a you great see- teaching tool. Yeah, I think it would be a great kit, in fact, to have a, some way to build that, you know? Um, in the, and people could do that in the classroom. That would be really cool. Yeah, you know? definitely. How's, how's this? Yeah. What was your interest in this? Well, I was I would just like to ask um, about your process a little bit, because, you know, to me, or at least forgive me now, my projection onto you is you have a fabulous mind. OK, and it's very, very evident that you have wonderful skills in being able to identify these gorgeous patterns of order that exist in the world we live in, you know, and what I'm curious about Uh, And it's a bit of a loaded question because, you know, I'm speaking like from my own personal bias here, but I have found um, that when I kind of begin to really explore geometry in a deep way, that very, very often these insights almost begin to accelerate, you know, and as I get one insight, more insights kind of come true. And then and then all of a sudden I can get really, really lifted up, you know, and it can all get very exciting very, very quickly. And, and somehow I feel geometry is this great amplifier for kind of like activating some sort of intelligence, which is within us. And I feel we plug into like a larger intelligence, which is, you know, for me, it's just like the intelligence that binds reality together or whatever is the way I look at it. And I would just love to ask you, like, is that is that feeling familiar to you or is that something that you've stumbled across or 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 maybe just if it felt right for you, you might share what happens for you in the process of your explorations with geometry. I'm kind of interested in the meditative fruits, I suppose, to a degree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's all that, um, you know, it's a totally creative process, of course, and I like to explore the, the different mediums because it's kind of like, um, you know, I've heard stories of like uh, scientists or whatever, and all of a sudden they start juggling or something, or they pick up something else and they explore through that. And all of a sudden they have that breakthrough insight through doing something else unrelated, but allows the subconscious to kind of work on that thing that it's working on, right? Or in the dream, state, it can come up that way. But I do that all around sacred geometry. So let's say I'm working really hard on a drawing. All of a sudden, I'll switch over to cutting out the patterns and making the form, right? And all of a sudden, that changes that. It's like like going juggling all of a sudden, because now I'm working with the same form, but new insights kind of emerge through that. And it's like entering into this dialogue you know, that is like a stream, a flow stream of consciousness. You don't know what's going to pop up, but all of a sudden this like, oh, wow, this connects to this, but it's not actually me looking for it. It comes to me through the process. So I don't go into it like I want to create this. 
or I want to find this. Many of the things I discover along my process with this, I don't actually know that someone else has found them till after I go and say, hey, what is this? And I look online and there it is on Wikipedia. I'm like, what? I just created that <laughs> object or that shape? It's like geometry is actually revealing itself to me that the same thing that other researchers from history have contributed to the field. So it's totally contained within the patterns. And, and that's, uh, I don't feel like let down by like, oh, someone else discovered it, sag my shoulders. It's like, that's just amazing, you know, that it's- uh, Yeah, that, yeah. That, that I, I, you know? Would you agree it's, that it's, it's a process of discovery rather than invention? Yes, totally. It is totally a discovery, you know, and that's why it's new and unique uh, every single time. So for me, it is a discovery. So even if someone else discovered it, it's new and alive for me in that moment. So everything always mm -hmm. comes back to the moment of discovery. It's new and fresh. Just mm -hmm. because someone else found it, or even if I discovered it two days ago or three days ago, uh, it's new and fresh in that moment. And that's what brings it alive. You know, it's not dead. The geometry is alive through that process. Well, you know, the way I look at it is, you know, there, there are these kind of like archetypal truths out there, you know, that these forms exist in some ideal realm to use a platonic analogy, you know? And so, so actually for me, when you, when you plug into something and there's some kind of insight revealed to you and you go, wow, this is incredible. You've discovered something fresh for you. It's new for you. And um, then the fact that somebody else has discovered it prior to you or a or, or, uh, hundred years ago or, or in ancient history, that almost kind of endorses it even more for me. That it's kind of like, wow, like this is even more cool now that, you know, other people are tapping into this realm. It's not just a little me, you know, because sometimes I have these breakthroughs and I go, oh, is this just some kind of wacky quirk of Jeff and then I kind of go and I go oh no like wow this could be a thing oh my god I think I'm tapping into a thing you know and then I'm then I get even more lifted up by it you know is is that familiar do you ever feel like that oh, yeah totally because it's like uh, it's like I don't want to say validating it doesn't have to be validated but all of a mm -hmm. sudden it says it's part of something bigger than what I am so I know that I'm not just creating it on my own you know what I mean mm. it's not me just following a creative whimsical thing it's it's following some principle geometric principles that are universal so it pulled yeah. it to that level of universality that someone a thousand years ago could be working with chipping away at clay or rocks or something like that and they're like whoa look at this you know and that's what i feel in that same moment i kind of wish yeah. that you, there was a graffiti and it would be like kepler was here you know and it says like <laughs> pythagoras you know carved into the stone you know like <laughs> you feel that way though sometimes when you when you encounter these ideas and you're like oh my god that archimedes came up with that you know yeah. like, like yeah. you you feel like you're suddenly in this company of these kind of luminaries but it's it's it you know it's accessible to all isn't it Mm. Oh yeah, and that's the beauty of geometry. Anybody can start doing it, and everything will can be revealed just with a little curiosity and creativity, and just breaking out of the box a little bit. You know, not just getting stuck that like the sacred geometry we have is where it ends. You know, mm. it, it can continue to reveal not only the things of the past, but whatever might be coming in in the future. You know. Mm. Um, so you have the ability to continue to kind of push that envelope, you know, and contribute to the field. So I feel everybody has the potential to contribute to the field when it comes from that, you know, non-egoic place. You know, it's not about I want to make a discovery to contribute. It's more or less this is speaking through us to elevate consciousness. You know, do you feel that working with geometry sort of gives you energy or, or, or makes you in some way? more creative does it does it feel that way to you yes yes definitely i mean uh, i feel alive in the conversation like this you know i feel like um the geometries want to express themselves you know so we become vehicles to express the geometry you know so when it moves through us however it's going to move through us because we're all different but it all of a sudden you could feel the animation you could feel it wanting to communicate and then all of a sudden it's like Oh, here's the geohedron. It wants to talk, you know? So, hey, I happen to be the fellow who worked on this, so I'm excited to share it, you know? So yeah. that geometry is kind of like we're an intermediary between those exciting um, those exciting finds. And didn't you yeah. post that you had discovered that 
uh, Frank Chester had um, kind of discovered a polyhedron that came from the same source that yours did from come from. Is that right? Uh, let me see. Let me let me follow up. How would you, how would you characterize that? Uh, I'm trying to refer to which one, Frank. What video that might have been in? I mean, for, I, I I've been working with Frank. Frank and I are going to do a video soon too together, which is exciting. You know, he's about eighty. Wow, that's great. Yeah, he's eighty years have you old. Been speaking to Frank. Yeah, Frank and I have been in communication now ever Ooh. since doing the Chestahedron video. So I have a bunch on his seven-sided form called the Chestahedron. I have six working on the six video. And it's amazing that Frank's form brought me to the Penrose tiling, you know, and that's the next video I'm going to do. It's like a couple of weeks. I'm sorry to dodge your question. I'll come back to it in a minute, Scott. No, no, um, no. This is lovely. This is lovely. I was, I was working with Frank's form and doing the drawings because everything I like to do on the iPad or whatever, I like to make it accessible that anybody could draw it afterwards because you can get lost creating all sorts of things, but it's kind of like backwards programming or something. How do we take that and then all of a sudden be like, can I teach this to a little kid? Can they draw that too? And, and so anyway, Frank's form all of a sudden brought me to the Penrose tiling and I watched a video like on... Uh, I had like a million views, the, the infinite pattern that will never go. And I watched it a couple of weeks ago and I was like, ah, I'll never get into Penrose tiling. You know, wow, that's just a whole nother thing. And then two days ago, Penrose tiling shows up. <laughs> it was actually in the drawing that I did. It was there in front of my face the whole time. I just didn't even know it was there. And then I was like, wait a second, that's Penrose tiling. And you know, Penrose tiling is really just part of the pentagram that the, the kite and the dart are, are segments of the pentagram. And his insight was that you, if we take these two parts of the pentagram, we can actually tile them and yeah. fill two-dimensional space perfectly, you know, yeah. but it, it all comes from the wisdom encoded in the golden ratio in the pentagram. It's sort of, that's, wow. that's where it comes from, I think. Exactly. And, and I've been working with this, uh, I have a video called As Above, So Below, where I came up with this awesome way to do a double vesica based on those two fire relationship circles. It easily draws a pentagon. In fact, here's an image. I'll give you the image of it as well, Scott. You can put it up. But that little design there is mm -hmm. so simple to create these perfect, you know, perfect pentagons uh, with this double phi ratio. And in that is the rhombus shape that creates the kite and dart. You know, it's right in that double vesica shape. Um, so you don't even have to draw the Pentagon or go about it that way. You can just create this little form and it was right there. But here's the thing. I mean, Frank's form, the one he he created, the Chestahedron, which is the double Chestahedron. I'm calling this the star Chestahedron. These rhombic faces are the kite dark uh, shaped rhombuses. And I didn't realize it until I made this form. So I didn't this is know that. Yeah. This is kind of how these things kind of just all link together. And it's kind of taking me on this journey, this trail that I don't even know I'm looking for. But all it mm -hmm. takes is kind of curiosity to ask the question, because I'll be looking at some of these things for a while and not even see what's there mm -hmm. <laughs> until the time is right. And then all of a sudden it reveals itself. Wow. Know? Wow. It, I, I love what you're saying, George. I really... I really uh, can relate to similar experiences in myself, but I'm interested in the chestahedron, you know, it's not a shape I know a huge amount about, only that like it's, um, it has seven faces, doesn't it? And and it's basically seven faces of equal area, even though like four of the faces have four sides and three of the faces of three sides, something like that. So it's different to platonic solids because it has two different shapes, doesn't it? Yes. What yeah. else did you find about the Chestahedron that was interesting? Uh, well, I got started with that um, because Frank created the equal area version of that, basically because he got kind of challenged by scientists to say, hey, you got to create equal areas if you want it to fit within that. But the way he first discovered was with the star, the, just the regular star point of the Pentagon, just taking three of those and then taking, you know, a tetrahedron and kind of opening it up and then just docking one into the other. And then, wow. but those all have equal area. They're slightly off. It's very close. But that's the one that really relates to the sacred geometry, you know, much more fully because now you're just working with the triangles and the pentagons. 
when you get that equal area, things adjust a little bit, but he had to do that to kind of meet the scientific criteria. Let's just say. Okay. Okay. So I did a video on that and I sent it to Frank right afterwards. And, you know, we, right away he called me up, you know, and we started talking about it. And he told me why he had to do the equal area and all those sort of things because of the challenge. Um, but really, I mean, the way he went about it was all about the, the five and the, uh, the tetrahedron, you know, the five points. Uh -huh. So it's uh -huh. got I can... three kite faces, three kite faces, which basically if you take a five-pointed star and you cut off two of them, you got those three left, you just fold them up, and the tetrahedron, mm -hmm. which is the triangle, four, four triangular faces. Uh huh. Okay. I'm with you. I'm with you. Yeah. And I remember I have his book actually uh, on that shape and I remember scanning through it. Oh, years ago now, but I remember, you know what you were saying there about like, you know, y sometimes you don't get to something until the time is right for you. You know, it's like, you have to get to a place where it begins to reveal itself, but something did strike me. He'd mentioned Rudolf Steiner, I think was an influence of his. And, um, I read a lovely book by Rudolf Steiner that spoke about, art as spiritual activity you know and and i really can relate to that actually uh, especially with sacred geometry but there was something about like um was there the seals of saturn or something like that and there was something about the sevenness and he did a seven pointed star um uh where he, there was basically the point i'm trying to make is this the seven sided shape seven foldness sevenness is very much linked to the chestahedron, isn't it? And so does the seals of Saturn mean anything to you? Or I, I am not familiar with it myself, but I just remember scanning through it and going, whoa, this is heavy duty. I didn't realize this shape went so deep. There's so much in it, you know? I'm just mm -hmm. curious. Well, I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not as much an expert, but I'll try and recall from the book too to kind of fill in the blanks there. Um, in, in the a, a building that Rudolf Steiner constructed, um, he did these uh, at the top of these columns were these chiseled in um, forms around the top. And Frank was visiting. And so the, at the top of that was chiseled in a seven sided form that Frank had saw. And then he wanted to then figure out how to make a seven sided form. I mean, he, he was a, a sculptor already. He had a lot of skills to work with a lot of different mediums. But until that point in time, he never did any, um, he didn't really work with sacred geometry. Like this is when he's 60. Right. So he didn't do a lot of geometry before that. He got inspired by this. And then all of a sudden, he took him on a 20 something year journey of discovering everything about the chestahedron, how it also fits inside the earth, um, how wow. it's connected to the form that's related to the heart. And, you know, he shows how the vortex in the heart is created. It's not a pump. And, and some of his videos are just great. You know, I was totally inspired by his work because. It's what got me to make all these forms, you know, because I saw him. Was it? Wow. Yeah. So I saw his work and the first form I ever built out of paper, you know, four years ago was the Chestahedron, you know, because was it? Cut out in the back of his book, I cut out his little temple and just folded up the Chestahedron. And then I made a bunch of Chestahedrons and I made star Chestahedrons. And all of a sudden I'm showing Frank pictures that I made years ago. I'm like, Frank, this is what I made years ago. This is what we're talking about now. You know, <laughs> wow. well, it's, so, it's, it's so cool, you know, him, by the way, and, and he's still alive, which is great, you know, because um, I'm going I'm now getting my appetite whetted to kind of like re-engage with Frank's work. You know, you, you've just got me on a Chestahedron vibe, George. Thank you very much. You know, um, yeah, I think the other thing he's really doing with sacred geometry in one of his lectures, he said, which has always been my motto has been really like, we have to take this further. You know, we can take it further. You know, that's what Frank did. He went out of the box a little bit to ask more questions. So when I first got inspired as one of the main people who got me interested, I was like, okay, well, let's just keep taking it further. Let's keep asking questions, seeing what we can do and, you know, continue to evolve the geometry as our human consciousness continues to evolve. The forms and the shapes and the patterns will also continue to. Evolve. I think we should give a warning to people that the more you get into geometry, the more the decorations in your house will be sacred geometry uh, diagrams and uh, zone tools and paper models. And, and pretty soon you're like, I, I see in your background there, George, it looks like your house is probably covered with sacred geometry everywhere. Is that, is, is that fair? Um, 
Yeah, there, there is definitely a lot around, but it's, you know, it feels like the house is filled with light, you know, I mean, they've got the light, in, but then all the light language of light, it's like, you know, all these diagrams that have been produced over years, which I go back and look at because they're carrying those nuggets that all of a sudden show up later. So I always I say a lot, you know, never get rid of, I mean, if you want to give it away or sell it or whatever to people, that's great. But don't get rid of those little doodles, you know, because all of a sudden you might come back to that later on and be like, wow, that totally connects to something I intuitively just came forward way oh, back. I love it. I love it. Uh, you're reminding me of um, the Buddhist principle that like when they make their mandalas, you know, the beautiful sand mandalas that they make that um, and they're basically putting all of their their scripture into the sand mandalas. Uh, there's a principle that what they're doing is that they're they're basically revealing the seeds of enlightenment right so the idea is that when somebody views one of the mandalas that like the the codes of enlightenment or liberation or whatever are embedded in in the energy of the mandala and so somebody like me who certainly is far from enlightenment you know might see the mandala and i go whoa that looks cool but already planted in my consciousness is the seed of enlightenment which, which some stage maybe in ten thousand lifetimes in my case may blossom into enlightenment you know but but what you're saying kind of echoes that sentiment that you know when we draw these things when there's little insights emerge and they're encoded in our drawings they're encoded in our work that they may blossom at a later date, further downstream in our lives. So I like what you're saying about like always kind of like harvest what's what's emerged for you. Trust yourself in a sense. Yeah. I think the more you mm. work with geometry, the more it kind of it has that seed quality where it's transforming you in some way. And it's really it's really subtle and, and it's hard to articulate, but there's something going on in the background when you're working with geometry. And it's like steadily kind of upgrading you in some way i feel me and, too uh, and uh and it's a mysterious process we, we don't really know how that's happening or what's going on but something's moving in you the more mm. you work with it oh totally yeah yeah i mean it's um i think that's why they've geometric patterns like that have been always iconicized in all sorts of um uh, places of worship, let's just say, or floor plans for temples or, you know, it, it, because that then carries that seed potential, you know, the, the mandalas that are created, it carries that seed potential for any, anybody, right. To just have that resonance, yeah. but it touches that place that just keeps showing up around you. And then all of a sudden it just clicks. And then all of a sudden there might be a new expansion that might happen at that point, you know, in, in awareness. Yeah. George, can I ask, do you have like a kind of a like, like a set formula or a set kind of modality? Like, like, are you very disciplined with your sacred geometry? Do you wake up every morning at seven o'clock and draw a geometric form? I'm, I'm joking a little bit because I certainly don't do that. You know, I have some favorite ways of working with geometry. I like to draw it. I personally like to make sand mandalas. That's kind of my thing. Um, but like, do you do you have a certain um, formula or a preferred modality? Uh, how does it work for you? Like what, what's your week like in sacred geometry? Or is it more like the wave washes over you and you just are taken by it and it's like, okay, now it's time to just go all in on whatever's moving. Yeah, well, uh, I don't set up a schedule or a routine around it, but the routine is kind of almost full time. <laughs> I mean, it really is. It just kind of takes a hold of you. So, you know, it's always... <laughs> It's not a kind of thought-based process that's going on. It's not like I'm just sitting here thinking about how to solve something and how to draw it. Like you go through those stages, but there's so much that happens in the in-between time. Like when you're looking at a flower, going for a walk, whatever, nature is doing it too. You know, nature, I have a huge connection to nature. I mean, that's a lot of my background. We might not even get into this video, but so that's continually prompting the connections. Um, so it is a kind of, once the switch is on, it's not going off type thing. So I don't know when the new inspiration will come or how it will come, but the switch is on to be receptive, you know? Mm -hmm. And then, then things just start to snowball and there will be these ebbs and flows, but I've got at least four different themes or threads I'm following. So whichever one kind of is emerged at the one time, well, that will be the one that I'm following at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I so it is you. not regimented. It's not a particular um, 
time that I'll do it. You know, anything I'm doing, if I'm driving or if I'm teaching some uh, in the woods, because that's what I do is I'm a, my, my main mode of profession is a wildlife tracker. <laughs> uh, so I people how to connect in nature and how to observe. That's what I do. Like I can really connect with people. So I'm always teaching in a pattern language, you know, teaching patterns, teaching how to read, observe patterns in nature. And this, that skill set just transferred over to this. But when you engage in that nature setting, you just have to maintain a level of openness to whatever comes your way. And then let that be the teacher. And then that starts to inform things. Yeah. Wow. I've had this wow, experience beautiful. of looking for chanterelle mushrooms and you're looking and looking and you're actively looking and you can't find anything. And then there's a moment when you kind of surrender and you go, I guess I'm not going to find any. And then you're like, wait, what is that right there? And you notice there's just under that leaf, there's a chanterelle. Oh my God, there it is. And then all of a sudden I've had this experience where you go, oh my God, there's another one and another one and over there. And suddenly you've tuned into their frequency and then you see them everywhere and you're, I'm an idiot. Oh my God. They were all over the place and I just yeah. couldn't see them. You know, oh. so there's like something that happens with that letting go and then being receptive mm. and then it all comes to you. Exactly. It's the same thing on the paper with the geometry we're talking about. And then that's how that applies in those natural settings it's uh you know when when people are out looking for tracks let's just say if you go in trying to look at the track trying to find the track you won't you often see the track you have to relax your vision you know allow it to kind of emerge you have to look more for light and patterns and reflections and light you know allow the light to come into your eye and actually to have your preconceived image of what you think you're looking for so you know a lot of times people have a preconceived image of that chanterelle should look like this, but it never looks like it does usually in the field guide. You know, it always has some peculiarity or difference. It's even more so with tracks. So you don't go in looking for that. You have to like look for the sh patterns of shadow, light, color, texture, edge, all those things, the whole, it's embedded in the whole. So that's been a lot of my training is coming from that avenue of um, oh. patterns in nature. It sounds like excellent pattern recognition training for anyone. You know? Oh, I think it's fundamental. In fact, one of the things that, uh, like, I brought out the, these two books, uh, you know, just a little history. I, I didn't know if I'd be doing that, but it's part of my pattern uh, from way back in 1996 when I really got into this. You know, Robert Lawler, of course, you know, he, he wrote the Big Sacred Geometry book, one of the, the mm -hmm. greatest time, and, you know, still got the fantastic information in there. He wrote this other book, which was actually the first book of Agata his. Probably most people don't know this one with their in the sacred geometry voices of the first day awakening in the aboriginal dream time by robert waller and this is wow. a pretty thick book look at this compared to the sacred geometry book <laughs> yeah. right? i got this back when i was like 18 you know and read this book up and that planted the seeds of tracking you know like the pattern recognition being connected to the earth connecting with nature but then because i knew of this book that he created waller's book I found sacred geometry. Like he did this book and this book, and that kind of still blows me away. But that was my connection to the, his work. Was and I think uh, he wrote that in like '82 or something? Yeah, this one, the, the this book, yeah, yeah, sacred geometry. But it was just amazing to me that that was the connection for him. He had some connection between, and for me, it planted two huge seeds that I followed both trails out. You know, in my mm. life. Wow. I'm loving hearing about your influences, George, you know, like 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 Frank is such a, a big influence. And I never knew that about Robert Lawler, that that he was such a, a sort of nature person as well. It makes sense, I suppose. Um, you know, sacred geometry is intimately connected with nature. In fact, it's a I'm like a city guy, you know, living in suburbia. And, and one of the great gifts that sacred geometry has given me has been this huge kind of like, uh, I wouldn't even say rebirth, like, but actual birth into the majesty of nature, you know? So I really try to get out. We have a big, big park in the city here, biggest park in Europe nearby. I try to get out there every morning just to walk, just to kind of like be in those big, big, big trees. And, you know, I, I know there's something really important about it. I, I don't fully understand it, to be honest, but, but it, it seems somehow to nourish all of this passion I have for sacred geometry. Obviously it's in, in every daisy, it's in every flower, it's in every tree, it's in probably in every blade of grass. I, I imagine if you look for it somehow, 
um, I bet you sacred geometry is in there. It's actually at, in at every least. atom, as we know, from it, yeah. the shape of the there you go. and everything, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm just, I'm conscious guys that like we, we could talk probably for three weeks nonstop, you know, but, but I'm, I'm also conscious of our dear listeners, you know, and we're trying to keep this format within a reasonable time window. I don't know how long we've gone for, cause I'm really bad at keeping track of time, but um, I'm just thinking, you know, before we go, George, you know, I'd love to give you the floor just to invite any of our listeners to um, connect with you, to to uh, enjoy some of the, the wonderful videos you've made. Where would people go to um, to, to see? Uh, you, you mentioned it at the start, but let's mention it again so so people yeah. can connect with you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the YouTube channels, New Geometry, uh, K-N-E-W Geometry, and I've got maybe 40 or something videos on there and the progression you'll actually if you you know i can't imagine anybody will watch from the start but some people have because they get really into it but progression you really see my progression through it you know from the beginning and it's only a year old the channel um so i've got a bunch of videos on there with the earth grid and i did a bunch on this crystal spiral in there and frank's work i've got in there and some of my own discoveries and then New Geometry website, uh, K-N-E-W Geometry again. Yeah, check that out. I just started offering an apprenticeship as well. I'm taking on six people. In fact, I had my first uh, session this week. I think I'm just going to continue to do that apprenticeship, you know, um, throughout the year, just resetting and redoing it again and kind of just working with that small intimate group in that context because I'm so familiar with that, of being a teacher of the, uh, the nature side of things with apprentices over the years as I've been a strong teacher in that field so that's exciting mm -hmm. and if you're ever interested in the uh, the tracking bit which you know i don't know if many of the listeners are listeners are but uh, mindful tracker is my other website which really is what i'm most well known for is the tracking side of things where i teach people you know observation in nature and connecting with nature in that way through this animal wow. track that's called that's the amazing. mindful tracker and a lot of that emphasis in there is uh, a lot on what we call inner, track, inner tracking. So um, it actually is a, like an inward journey. And I believe sacred geometry is the same thing. I mean, whatever interest I have always has this inner component, you know, how it brings you on the inward journey. So the mindful tracker has that inner tracking component, just like the sacred geometry points us back home, you know, in, internally to ourselves too. So those Beautiful. are the two, two ways to check out a little bit more about what I'm up to. Okay. Wow. George, thank you. Thank you. It's so nice um, to get to know you a little bit better. And your background is fascinating. I have to say it's like an absolute joy um, to, to reconnect with you and a privilege to have you as our very, very special guest, our first guest on our podcast, you know? So um, it's, it's been a, an absolute gift, hasn't it, Scott? Absolutely. Thank you so much, George, for being a trailblazer not only with our forum and our first guests, but also in geometry. So keep it up. All right. Thank you so much, both of you. I really appreciate this time together. So peace till next time. Thank you. Thank you, George. And thank you, Scott. And most of all, thank you, dear listener. You know, it's like uh, this is a, a, a project of passion. It's great fun for us to do, um, even if there isn't a listener out there. But but we we sure hope there is. And that if you've listened this far, thank you very much. We're going to keep on keeping on with these podcasts. And we look forward to seeing you back here soon. Thank you very much.